Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I have what I have termed a malignant respiratory infection, a malignant cold, so I hope I'll get through this without too much coughing or sputtering. Okay. Well, the progress in large cell lymphoma was dramatic early on, then plateaued for a long time, then hit a new success, and now has plateaued again. And these were the original studies we did with multi-agent chemotherapy, showing with 20 years of follow-up now that very clearly the failure-free survival and the overall survival is about 30 to 40 percent. And this includes, obviously, on the overall survival, patients who might have been transplanted at that time. But these studies were more than 25 years old, and they persisted as the only way to go until the introduction of rituximab. As you know and have seen, the simple introduction of this monoclonal antibody, which is targeted therapy, it's just that the target is present in essentially all or almost all the cases of de novo large cell lymphoma. And that resulted in another 10 to 15% breakthrough. So now we can expect, as you've heard before, about 60%. But since that introduction of rituximab, we have not challenged the remaining 30 or 40% of patients in a successful way. And Jonathan showed you how some of those uh, may be in the double hit translocation or the double expressors. The problem has been we've known for a long time and the most prominent prognostic factor in index I think I've ever seen develop, the IPI back in 93, that basically we could segregate patients on these factors of age, LDH, performance status, stage, and extranodal involvement, but the problem is that those factors are not targetable. I wish I were younger. I wish my LDH could change, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing I can tackle there. So whereas they segregated patients into groups, they did not point a direction, okay? In fact, the most recent hint on that is our large randomized trial looking at transplant upfront versus delayed at relapse, which was conducted by the intergroup and published in the New England Journal of Medicine a year or so ago, where basically patients who were high-risk patients, since we had learned that transplant in the lower-risk patients had absolutely no benefit up front, high-risk, high-intermediate, or high-risk patients could either get delayed or early transplant. And the results of that showed, as you expected, that there was a benefit to transplant in terms of PFS, but unfortunately there was no benefit in overall survival. And then on a subset analysis, which did feel for me like we were looking more and more down the hole following the mouse into the uh, mouse hole, we got down to the fact that as seen on the left side, there was no benefit for the high intermediate patients, but the high risk patients, a relatively small subset of this group, did attend a pair to benefit in transplant in both overall survival and PFS. And that's been the only lead we've really had for a while as to how to take on this different prognostic groups. So CHOP, Rituxan became the standard of care and remains so with transplant potentially for the high-risk groups. Now, one of my favorite paradigms is just because you have a problem doesn't mean you have a solution. And this came from when I was the Italian lymphoma coach. It's a long story. I look very good in that. I just didn't recognize that sweatsuit and then I remembered Photoshop that's my head, but not my body. The Italians are very good at this. So the question of the note today is, we then found out that there were different types of molecular lymphoma. And the excitement, this is now more than five years old, was very clear that we thought this would open up targetable therapies. And I'm going to basically show you and remind you that germinal center B always does better than activated B in the overall upfront population. And that what is important is that there are different genetic abnormalities as shown on that gene array, but expressed here. But really what you might care about is that we now have a group of new agents that could be used to target these various different genotypes. It's a little lopsided, as you see, because most of the agents are on the ABC pathways. But in fact, there are now some agents coming along on GCB. Maybe we can feel a little better 
because there's more of a problem on the ABC side. But remember, this is not follicular lymphoma or mantle cell lymphoma. This is a lymphoma where we cure 60% of the patients with existing R-CHOP. Would Dr. Chesson, my most chemotherapy, hating chemotherapist, be willing to give up chemotherapy in the large cell lymphomas? Even Bruce wouldn't do that. So now we have a problem of not replacing with biologic agents, but we have a problem of how we could integrate biologic agents into the R chemotherapy or other platforms. And you've seen this before, the B cell receptor, one of the most important receptor families in these diseases, the downstream kinases of this, particularly sick BTK, et cetera, all offer targets in which we could attack, okay? And there is data from the laboratory and cell lines that if you attack the GCB and the ABC with inhibitors of the proteasome, in fact, it's only the ABC that works. So again, suggesting the target overexpressed on the ABC side, and maybe we could poison it. And some very preliminary data. These are very small numbers. Read 12 and 15. Relapsed patients, then treated with bortezomib and EPOC-R, and instead of the ABCs doing worse, the argument is in this small number, they did better than the GCB relapses. But that's not quite, as we're gonna tell you, the same as saying that uh, bortezomib is gonna make a difference here. Okay, so why should we look at the germinal center origin? How could we detect, do a phase two clinical trial testing the value of bortezomib in untreated ABC, because that would follow what I just showed you here, right? That the suggestion is that the bortezomib is making a factor, and we could see. So we could randomize patients to R-CHOP plus or minus bortezomib. If we assume that about 45% of the large cells are non-GCB or ABC, if we assume a 60% response rate, and we want to target a 20% improvement, and we may lose 10% of the patients, this randomized phase two to get a positive signal needs 364 patients screened to get 82 patients randomized per arm. And if you blow this up to the classic phase three design, you can see we're looking at trials of thousands of patients. Now it turns out there is a trial like this that has been done, and I believe it is in press, but I haven't had the official documentation. It's not my trial. But let's say you won't be stopping your current practices based on the results of this phase two trial. Well, another agent, PKC beta pathway coming from Margaret Shipsworth work, and that's enzostorin in relapse refractory. Phase two study, a few people, heavily pretreated, did well for a long time. A randomized phase three was calculated, conducted of R-CHOP plus enzostorin. The results of that are negative, but I have not, if anybody's seen that paper, I'm waiting to see that paper. It's been a long time, but we haven't seen the results of that paper. So then what about these BTK inhibitors or these, uh, these appropriate pathway inhibitors, okay? Well, what you've seen, unfortunately, on the new inhibitors, kind of globally, all global statements are inherently wrong, but DLBCL seems to get the short end of the stick. There aren't any that I know of that I can think of, and correct me if I'm wrong, where DB DLBCL is the prototype of the most active for these agents. So there is activity, most of it's PR, and the question is, can mining our chop with DLBCL, will it make a difference? It turns out, don't do this as they, what do they say in the safety ads? Kids don't try this at home, you could hurt yourself. Don't do this off study. It turns out that putting targeted agents together with R-CHOP turns out to be somewhat more toxic. Global answer again, details to follow. But you certainly can't expect you can necessarily get away with it. So, a phase two study, 70 adult patients with relapse refractory DLBCL, 
getting a brutinib. And as shown on this slide, what they show is a modest response rate of about 40%, but it highlights that there are no responses in the GCB type, essentially. So there are several others, but if you think about this, we almost don't have a choice as to whether we want to segregate by GCB or ABC. The data suggests that the BCR inhibitors have almost no value in the GCB patients, and therefore half of your study will have no benefit. That doubles the amount of benefit at least you have to see in the ABC type to be able to get a positive signal. So if we are looking at trying to figure out whether these agents help us or not, and we don't know the answer to that, I will say, we have no choice but to conduct the studies in the ABC alone. Sick, another target, same kind of thing, some PRs, modest activity. So these are very hard trials to run. These are not for the faint of heart. You have to screen a lot of people, and you have to treat a lot of people. The toxicity could well go up. The new agents may not be sufficiently active. So am I arguing against myself? No, not really. The problem is we don't have a choice because we will never find the activity of these new agents if we treat everybody with all of them. They do not have significant activity in both cells of origin. We have no choice but to conduct the studies in separate populations. Thank you for your attention.